Welcome everybody to another, this will be an amazing podcast, Personal Development Without the Fluff. I'm so looking forward to this. Um, I brought Guy on here as well and basically told him like, you should definitely be here because this is going to be an amazing conversation. So Guy, just say hi real quick. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll tell you why it's going to be amazing. This, this is just a really funny story before we jump into this. So um, our guest today, I'll, I'll share his name in just a second, was introduced to me. Uh, we get asked to, to bring certain guests on, introduced to me. And my, my initial reaction was like, okay, you know, and I looked him up and he's, uh, the way it was proposed to me was he's really big into health and specifically he knows everything there is to know about oils, which we might scratch on today. So when I got on a pre-interview with him, I was like, all right, so tell me about oils and straight and ironically enough, I'd actually <laughs> bought his product on Amazon cause I wanted to try it, uh, because I'm big into omegas and things like that. <laughs> and we get on the phone and within the first two minutes, he goes, Oh yeah, that's just like something that I kind of do, but this is what I'm really interested in. And we ended up having an hour long conversation that at the end, I just wish had been recorded <clears throat> because it was that damn good. Like we went into so many different places and, um, I'm really excited because I honestly have no idea where this conversation is going to go. I just hope that you get ready and buckle in because uh, with the three of us on here, I'm sure it's going to go into some incredible spheres and will be some incredible transmission for you to digest. So with that, I just want to really honor and bring our amazing guest, Udo Rasmus. Welcome to the show. Okay. I'm so glad to be here. We had, a, we had a good interview and I love what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. So it was, it was a little bit of a shock when uh, Udo showed up onto our live Q and a session. And I was like, wait, the, the same guy that I, it was, it was just awesome. Um, and we've had some, <laughs> some conversations back and forth, but uh, I got, that's because I got the announcement. Let's see, let's see, <laughs> let's see what Listen. these guys really do. <laughs> um, so before we go, you know, wherever we're going to go, I would love for you just to share a little bit about, cause you have a really cool, background story of how you kind of got to where you are today. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to leave it open and you can share whatever feels good okay, for you. Sure. So I was born in Europe during the Second World War. My parents came from Latvia and Estonia. And when Hitler and Stalin did their non-aggression pact, Latvia went to the Soviet Union and po part of Poland went to Germany as part of the, you know, the perk for signing, <laughs> signing the agreement. But there was nobody from Latvia or Poland at the meeting. So they just took it. <laughs> and my parents loved the Russians, but hated communism because they took everything away from everybody. Mm. So they decided to go to Poland, which had become part of Germany. And he was given a, a, a farm in Poland that belonged to somebody else as part of this, this, <laughs> this agreement deal between the, 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 the two dictators. And uh, so I was born on, basically born on a stolen farm in Poland. Mm. And my background is German and Swedish. So we spoke German at home. And at the end of the war, we, we, we were refugees. My mother with six kids, six and under, I was two, uh, were fleeing from the Russians from Poland to Germany. And they were chasing us in tanks and trucks. And the allies were using the refugees as target practice on the roads that we were fleeing on. Wow. These are the good guys. And they were like, there were no soldiers on those roads. They were just women and children and horse-drawn wagons. And there were dead horses and dead people in the ditches. And my mother ended up getting off the road and going through the fields because it was safer because the roads were getting, getting shot at and left four of the kids behind. One of, one of them was me. And, you know, and then through a whole lot of other things that happened, we eventually got reunited. I remember mostly the fear and the anxiety and the confusion and, and I kind of grew up very shy, didn't feel like I, I didn't know what I could depend on. I didn't feel like I had a lot of support. And um, when I was six, we were living in Germany and I listened to adults argue and they argued about crazy stuff, crazy shit. And the thought occurred to me, like, there has to be a better way to live than this. And at I'm the age of six, six, and I'm going to find out how. And I was like, that's been my driver all my life. Mm -hmm. So I then, when I got older, you know, I was always experimenting with things to trying to figure out how things work. So 
I mean, there's lots of jokes about all the sh things I wrecked, <laughs> trying to figure out how they work. And when it came to getting educated, I ended up in university in science, because science, you learn how things work. And then I got tired of it because it's too theoretical. Yeah. I got into biosciences. I wanted to know how creatures work. And then I got into psychology to figure out how thinking works. All this is important if you want to know a, a better way to live, right? Yeah. And then eventually, I, then I left university because what I was looking for, I didn't find. And I ended up with self-knowledge because what I really needed to know all that time was how I work. <laughs> And that's basically is my background. So I have a very good background in science. And I, you know, in self-knowledge, I started doing a practice to get present in my own life because I had the program of a war baby. And, and I got in, when I got in, in touch with what it feels like to be alive, I rewrote my whole life. I've got 9,000 pages of rewriting my whole story mm -hmm. from a, from a war baby to a, to a loved by life baby, let's mm. be a good way to put it. So, so I, we may touch on the oil stuff, but honestly, yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. yeah. The oil is a smart, smarter part, I smaller part of the, the the big story. This is the big story. Yeah, the small story is I got poisoned by pesticides in 1980. My marriage had fallen apart. I wanted to kill something. I took a job as a pesticide sprayer because that's what they do. They kill things. And I did that for three years, very carelessly, got poisoned, went to the doctor. Doctor said, we don't have anything. Penny dropped that my health is my responsibility. And I went into, because I had the background, I went into the journals to look up uh, health and nutrition, disease and nutrition. Because if your body is made out of food and you get sick, if you raise the standard of the food, then in, in a year, you will have rebuilt 98% of your body to a higher standard. Wow. And so I got stuck on oils because they are the most confusing area. They're the most damaged. They're the most sensitive nutrients. The omega-3s were just established to be essential the year after I got poisoned. So I got in front of the omega-3 parade. And I, and I found out how much damage is done to oils by industry to give them shelf life. And then by cooking, when, when we cook, use, use them for that. And I said, I can't get healthy on oils like that. We should make them with health in mind. Developed a method for protecting from light, oxygen, and heat. And, um, and then out of that came flaxseed oil. That was my first oil. And then I became omega-60 efficient on it because it's poorly balanced. Yep. And I then developed a blend that literally is a one-stop shot for everything good that you need from fats and nothing you should avoid. And the, the book is called Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill. Because there are two completely opposite stories when it comes to fats. That's the short story. That's that's something you know. You said a line when we were doing the pre-interview that I thought was really interesting. You got interested in oils specifically because oils is the most misunderstood thing. Because there are oils, in fact, that can heal, and oils, in fact, that can kill. And that's I right. think one of the only. Uh, <clears throat> well, yeah. You with minerals, you either you get them or you don't get them, right? But with oils, you know, and literally, why I call it. Fats that heal, fats that kill. You got to understand there are two opposite stories. And then you got to figure out which ones heal and which ones kill. And depending on whether you want to kill yourself or heal yourself, you pick the ones that do that job. Amazing. Right? So that kind of became like the health part of you and, and you went yeah. on, on that mission. But that was a tip of a much, much deeper that was, iceberg. That, that, was, that was a big enough project that I thought I'd, I want to start with that because the, my other project is, is so big that I wasn't sure I could pull it off. So I wanted to cut my teeth on something and it just happened at the right time. And yeah, and I, I got, get, got to go out 15 years. I spent uh, six to nine months in, uh, living out of a suitcase, traveling 40 countries, telling the story. But in behind it was always the other story, you know, that, how do, because I'm interested in anything that improves quality of life sure. at any level, whatever, whatever that is, because honestly, we come in with, with potential of being masters, masters in the best tradition, like Buddhas or, or, you know, like, like fully present, fully enlightened people. We come into the world with that potential and look at where the fuck we end up. Right. And why is that? And in, in the Fundamentally, it's because we, 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 we come out of the body as little Buddhas. I call the, the womb the Buddha tank, right? And, and then we, 
come into the world in a Buddha tank, it's safe, everything's taken care of, there's nothing to do, nowhere to go. So you're just hanging out in, the, in bliss or whatever you call it, right? In the inner light that is your life. <clears throat> and then we come out and then we got to get to know the world and then our senses take us out <clears throat> away from ourselves and we go from being present inside and absent outside to being present outside and absent inside. And that's the disconnect. That's the, our disconnect from ourselves. And when we got disconnected, there's a symptom of that and it's called heartache or thirst of the heart or emptiness. I mean, we, I've got 10 pages of words that people use for that place when, you're, when the center of your chest hurts and it's not physical. And that's your call to bring your awareness back home. Yes. But most people don't know that because nobody told them. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we think, oh, I'm lonely. So I, I'm looking for a girlfriend. And the novels talk about how you feel this emptiness and you feel this longing and you feel this. And then the girl comes along and then the girl, you know, the girl is the answer to your longing and you live happily after, after happily ever after, which is complete bullshit. Right, because the story ends when when the trouble begins. <laughs> right, and so they don't tell you that part. Yeah. Right, but we also do. You know, I mean, we try to get really financially rich because of that ache, and we go to war because of that ache. I mean, everything we do in our life is to somehow feel whole again. The drive to feel whole, or feel content, or feel uh, uh, fulfilled. That's the driving force of every human being. And then people in the world harness that and they get you to do their stuff and they promise you satisfaction or whatever they promise you. And in the end, you never get it. And we're so used to it that we say, okay, satisfaction guaranteed. I didn't get satisfaction, but I'm putting up with it anyway. Yep. Right? Yep. And, the, and the whole time that thing was not about anything outside because if the disconnect is inside, then the reconnect has to be inside as well. Amen. And, and, and imagine if eight, pil eight billion people on this planet knew that and did the voluntary solitude to reconnect, to be with themselves and to reconnect and to discover how incredibly beautiful life is. Imagine what that would be like to live in a world like that. And there's no reason why we can't go there because it's already built into us and we better fucking go there because otherwise we're going to destroy ourselves, each other and the planet. That's, I mean, I think the reason why you and I connect on such a level is because yeah. you know that we're, that, that's Satori Prime's mission, right? It's like, yeah. you know, my hope and prayer that we can create enough frequency change in yeah. the immediate circles and that we, we impact that offers that to the collective, which then ripples through the 8 billion. I mean, that's and we, and life's we work. Can. And we, and we can. can. We, we're doing it moment by moment by moment. Absolutely. And we're I, now, under, and you know what? We're now under pressure to, to cut the bullshit. That's you know, right. Out of pressure from, from everywhere. Like a hundred years, people could get away with it. A thousand years, people could get away with it. We're not getting away with much anymore. That's true. And not to mention, it's like... Um, nothing, nothing like a kick in the ass to, to, to motivate you. <laughs> moving, yeah. but, if, but if you fell in love with your life, that would be even better. So we need to go from a kick in the ass to get us going because, you know, when, when the kick ends, when we move far enough that the kick ends, we stop. So we need to, con to, to convert the fear into inspiration, you know, to the of destruction into love of creation or love of life. And that's, a, that's an interesting conversion too. Right? Prosky, you I wanted, like, to, you wanted people, to ask something? No, I did, but I, I actually love having guests on here that I have to say very much because they're so freaking brilliant. It's just fun to listen to them talk. Yeah, right. I'm like, you just do you, man. Yeah. <laughs> Udo, I'd love, okay. I'd, love for you, I'd love for you to share, you know, because you said, obviously, your upbringing. And I think this is really important for people to understand. <clears throat> we all chose a certain life path, at least my belief. I don't know this to be factual, but my belief is that we all, as a soul, chose a certain life path. You know, like you chose to be born into that uh, post-war time with a yeah. mom and so, like, like right. that was a chosen path. And obviously that created certain patterns for you. And then you've kind of been unpacking, unraveling, finding more of yourself, finding that deeper place mm -hmm. and love and source. So you had shared with me some amazing stories of uh, 
some kind of life altering experiences uh, oh. that you had that yeah. kind of started setting you on this path. Cause as a six year old, you had a question. You're like, there's gotta be another way. Yeah. And then there were things along the way that happened that kind of kept nudging you to certain yeah. places to really experience this. So I'd love for you just to share the kind of work that you've done to get to this level of, of experiential knowledge. <clears throat> yeah, there's, there are lots of stories and it's just, and because I felt I couldn't, I couldn't le rely on much on the outside of me. My mother had, had left me behind that probably created a pretty big notch in our trust, in my trust, generally speaking. Right. For sure. <clears throat> my father came home completely wrecked from the war. And apparently the first time he picked me up, he told me this three years before he's, he uh, died. He said, he said, uh, he was, I was 18 months old when he first saw me cause he was off to war. Right. And he, he knew who, who I was and I didn't know who he was. Right. Mm -hmm. So he swooped down to pick me up his kid. And I started to scream and the thought went through is that I will never get along with this kid. And we then, because he believed it, we then played that out for like 30, 40 years. Sure. Right. <clears throat> so, so I, there wasn't a lot of support there. I used to think my parents didn't love me, but of course they did because they could have cooked and eaten me <laughs> right? and they didn't do that. And they did buy the clothes and they did cook the food. And, you know, they, you know, we had lots of work to do and I got, I got whacked a lot, but part of it was because I was very curious and I was always into stuff that I shouldn't be into, you know? So, but, but it was probably the first time was why I was 15 and I was, I was, I was so intensely angry at my own man. Mm. <clears throat> that I spent a couple of years trying to figure out how I could off him without getting caught because wow. he was ruining my life and I wasn't going to ruin my life by doing that to him, but I couldn't come up with the way. So I left home at 16, but I was lying in bed when I was 15 one night and just like, I just, it was nice and warm in bed and I, my whole body was filled with light, which is not a usual experience for most people. And the thought came to me is I am not very socially adjusted, but there's mm -hmm. absolutely nothing wrong with me. And that was nice. That was nice. That was, and fundamentally because I didn't have the support on the outside or I didn't see the, the support on the outside. I tended to go to look for support where support was. And guess what? The most powerful support for every human being is life from the inside, loving the body unconditionally. 24-7, 365, never asking for anything back, never taking a weekend off, never going on strike for better wages. And even if you hate your life, your life is in behind all of that, taking perfect care of you, right? Yeah. So, so, and so I was looking for my support there. And then what happened, uh, I have many stories, but I, I did psychedelics when I first came, uh, went to university a little later, actually. Actually, act, actually more like at the end of my university stay. I did a, a tri LSD trip. I was in science. Nobody was doing it. But in arts, they were, they were uh, experimenting with psychedelics. And so I, I was working in neurological research. And they had a hundred and... Uh, 44 ampoules of Sandoz LSD in little ampoules, 100 micrograms per ampoule. And I snitched six of them out of the back of the thing. They weren't using them. And I did a, 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 a trip on, we put it, we broke, you break the, the ampoule and then we uh, soaked it into a sugar cube. And I probably had 60 micrograms. Uh, uh, LSD trip, Sandals acid, like pure acid. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I was listening to Mozart lying on the floor, rolling around, laughing in time to the music and crying at the same time. Yeah. Because what struck me as the, most, the craziest thing was that all of this stuff that I was so studiously looking out, outside for was all already inside of me. Mm. That was a big change. And it kind of blew open my, my war baby world. And, I, I, and, you know, psychedelics do that. When you get stuck in your mind ruts, what it does is it, it breaks open options because it reconnects your, your, it re, reconnects your, your, your brain, your, your nervous system. 
in different ways. So you actually have more, uh, more openness to possibilities. And that's why it's so good for depression and anxiety and PTSD and uh, addiction and, uh, you know, chronic fears and chronic, chronic habits that when they're, when they're not, not helpful, then that's one way to get a start yeah. on, on breaking that open and, and finding better ways. And then after I left university, I, I start, decided since I was a, a uh, you know, I grew up in a Christian culture, although my parents were not religious. For them, nature was the religion. Mm. But I grew uh, so, but one day I decided, you know, they're still talking about this Jesus guy 2,000 years later. And nobody remembers my grandfather. <laughs> and he wow. hasn't been dead for 50 years. Wow. What's the difference? So I wanted to find out what was the difference. What was the thing about that made him interesting enough that people still talk about him? So I got the red letter edition where everything Jesus said was in red and everything else was in black ink because I just wanted to know what the master's issue was. What, what, was, the, what was it? And I did some things and I put him to the test. I had some really interesting experiences that year. Mm. And uh, eventually I got in with a group of people that came from California. They called themselves the Jesus People's Army. And that should have been a warning to me <laughs> <laughs> because love and army are <laughs> somewhat oppositional terms. Yep. But I didn't, I, I, it, that didn't occur to me. I thought, well, they must be looking, they must be trying to discover what I'm trying to discover. And maybe I'll hang out with them and, and I'll, I'll learn something. Right. If, I mean, if you want to learn, you go where you figure your learning will go. So they did a coffee house. I walked into the coffee house, sat down by the table, and this guy swooped in next to me. And I didn't say hi or anything. I just said, it must be possible to see God and live. Because we were told as kids, you can't, if you see God, you die. But then Jacob did, and Moses did, and Jesus did, and Elijah did, and Elisha did. And there's a whole bunch of people who saw God. You know, Enoch, you know, walked with God. And he was not, and then he was, and you know what? And then it's like, well, why can't I see God and live? Because I think it's important. So, so I said that it must be possible to see God and live. And he freaked out. He just he went ballistic. He said, "You're from the devil. You're from the Antichrist. Get out!" <laughs> so I get up and I get out. And I'm on the sidewalk. I'm really confused. It's wow. like, Shit, I haven't seen God. You know, and, and maybe maybe I'm not supposed to ask this. And you know, they have something in the Bible where you say there are certain questions you're not allowed to ask. If you ask them, it's really bad. Hmm. So I thought, oh, well, maybe I just asked the bad question. <laughs> wow. And I went into nature for the weekend to clear my head. And I was living on the beach, and in in uh, and I went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, and, and I was really confused. I was confused. I was desperate. And I was really sincere and I really wanted to know. I mean, I remember that. It's like, you know, desperation sometimes leads to immense insincerity, yeah, deeper yeah. sincerity than you can come up with in any other state. And uh, so, so that's how I went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, I woke bolt upright. And there was a being made of light. It's there. No drugs this time. No drugs. No drugs. Completely sober. Uh, and embodied a message, like didn't say anything. It wasn't, didn't say on here, this I am Jesus or anything. And I didn't know who it was because I it didn't have a name. But the message that it embodied, I could put words to. And the message was, I am come not to judge, but to love. Now, I don't know if you can find a more succinct summary of the message of the masters. Hmm. I am come not to judge, but to love. And uh, so then, then I, I just feasted on that. Then it was like, well, is that my life or is that my spirit or is that an angel or is that the master? And actually, they're all the same. Yeah. The truth is the master is life. Within you lives the master. That thing that loves you unconditionally 24-7 is the master. The master because... It is the master of your body. So when I, if I point to your body and say, hey, whose body is that? You say, it's my body. You've just told me that you're the owner of the body, that you are not the body. Yeah. And who is the owner of the body? Well, life, because it is omnipresent. 
everywhere present in your body, omniscient, all-knowing in your body, and omnipotent, all power in your body, is life. And that's what the masters talked about. And that's what the masters, we don't see it in the scriptures, but that's what the masters, when, when they're do, talking to people who like their energy because they're in a good place, because when you're fully present, you're in a good place and it's attractive. And people who like that attractive and said, how can I live like you are? How can I be like you are? That's what they talked to them about. They were human nature. They were teachers of human nature. That's they were right. helping people. And they, I, I think probably all of them taught a method of practice where you sit still, get quiet, see how deeply quiet you can get, see how long you can stay there and see what you discover about who you are, what you are, your being in that state. Because when you do nothing, you become everything. And when you, and when the more you do, the less you become, yeah. because your focus goes on your doing when what you, when to know your, yourself, your focus needs to go on your being. And it's unbelievably beautiful. It is un we are unbelievably, unbelievably magnificent in the experience of our own being. Serene, and, serene and, wouldn't it, and wouldn't it be nice if 8 billion people knew that and then accessed it? Yeah. So let's talk and about then, that. Yeah. And then, <laughs> then what happens? Okay. So I feel because life takes care of me when I focus into life and maybe behind that into just pure awareness, mm -hmm. which is the, the formless container of everything out of everything that everything comes out of. I feel so taken care of that. I don't want to steal your shit anymore because I have enough. I have more than enough. And when I stop stealing your shit, we can probably be friends. Yeah. Or at least we can get along. Right. And when we can get along, it doesn't take very much to say, you know what? It is right that every human being on this planet should have all their basic needs met, no matter whether they're crazy in their head or whether they're sick in their body or whether they came from a really bad social situation and learned a lot of bad habits or their environment is a mess, right? Because life is the same perfect health perfect being no matter what's going on everywhere else and to tap into that then also then you have a standard from which you can build a world in the image of that content exactly. of that magnificence and then you start treating people with respect and a lot of people who are who you don't you know who we don't like and who we discriminate against or you know who we put down they had a really hard time they didn't learn what we learned Absolutely. Uh, Gabor Mate, you know who he is? Gabor Mate works with, works with addicts. He's a psychiatrist from Vancouver. Mm -hmm. he, he worked with addicts, addicts for 10 years. And his summary of, of that story was, we punish addicts for having been abused as children. Oof. Yeah. And when I heard that, it was like, fuck. Yeah. Right? Wow. And then people would get really self-righteous and because they were rich and because they were born in, in favorable circumstances, they think everybody should do, you know, everybody should pull themselves up by their bootstraps, but they never did that themselves. Yep. <clears throat> right. And so they're taking for granted and they're arrogant about it. And you know what? Everybody start, everybody was a Buddha in their mother's womb and everybody gets lost and everybody can find their way home again. And that to me is like, that's the journey. And human beings are the only creatures that have that issue because trees never, you know, trees never externalize their awareness. They yeah. just stand there. They're standing. They're all Buddhas. They never get, they never get confused, right? Animals, they'll go, they'll go out in their senses to chase something, but then they'll go back to, to themselves. And what we do is we go out and then we go into our head yep. instead of going back to our heart. Yeah. And so for humans, only humans have to make time to sit still, to reconnect to themselves mm -hmm. among all the, all the creatures, right? And it's just a uniquely human challenge. It's not like, it's not like a big deal. 
because it's not even it's not even that hard to do it. it I wouldn't even say it's a challenge. It's almost like the game that our souls know we signed up for, but we forget on the way that that's the game that we're playing. And then somehow we, right. some of us, some right. of us get to come right. into this plane and tap each other on the shoulder, you know, the way right. that we've been doing and you've been doing, et cetera, to like other people and be like, hey, pst, remember? Yeah. Remember yeah. who you actually are? Like, yeah. that's the game. And then yeah. we just go around like tagging people and be like, hey, remember? <laughs> and then yeah, yeah. more people play the game. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's only a challenge when you when you when you don't know when you don't know what it is, but you know yeah. there's something wrong. Yeah. Well, like you, like we have you, this incredible. Right, you get, sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. I was gonna say, like you you took LSD and in that moment there was a uh a, a much bigger awareness that took you outside of the frame of the human condition. It, it just occurred to me a few days yeah. ago, we call it the human condition, but it's another yeah. way of saying a conditioned human. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so like what, yeah. what we're really talking about is like uncon like an unconditioned mm -hmm. human. And now part, part of the beautiful part about some of the awareness that you're talking about is the moment you step out, you can, you can see the condition and it gives you an experience. An or experience step, or of, step of in. I'm sorry, go ahead. Or step in, or stepping in, right? And it's ironic because whether you whether you're an Elon and I work on this, whether you're an internal system or an external system, yeah. they both end up in the same place. Yeah. So it just depends on kind of like how you're geared and what's easier access points for you. Yeah. Um, but I think to to your guys' point, right? We we have this society that keeps trying to move faster as if we just keep <laughs> moving at a fast enough pace, we'll finally figure it out. It's like we're trying to outpace life. But life is so patient, has so much energy and, mm -hmm. and force and vibrancy. It's like, we're never going to outrun this thing. But mm -hmm. like you said, humans are perhaps, as, as far as we know, from sentient animals that we've met, and I'm sure there are many, many others um, that we haven't, <laughs> that, that it would be prudent for us to create a society. Because I was trying to think, okay, so like if, if coming out of the womb, you're a Buddha, but you're a Buddha that's born into a, a, a world of disillusionment, so immediately from the second you enter the planet, it's just bombarded by disillusionment. Right. So you never right. have an, you never even have an authentic sense of self, which is why something like a psychedelic journey or sitting in silence for long periods of time, what you get a taste of or a glimpse of right. is an authentic self. <laughs> and suddenly it, it's not necessarily like, Hey, now I know where to go, but it's like somewhere out there is an orientation that if I orient myself to, I'm going to continue to get more glimpses of an authentic self of this mm -hmm. Buddha mastery. And, and so if we start creating space for slowing down, which right now the world seems to be doing the exact opposite, if anything, yeah. um, you know, it, it really can be the beginning of a significant big change in society. Yeah. So, you, you know, uh, the way I say it sometimes is being is more important than doing. For well, sure. How do you know? Because you can be without doing, but you can't do without being. That's right. Yeah. Right. So being is the foundation. So you're trying to build a house, and you're trying to build a house, and you don't know what the foundation looks like. So how do you know how to build a house? Yeah. Right. If you don't know the foundation, you you don't know how far it goes. You don't know how much it holds. You don't know what it's made of. You know you don't you don't know what structure to build on it. So, so then you create an arbitrary structure, and half of the time it's it doesn't work. You have to know your foundation if you want to build something that, that works. Yeah. You have to. And the being is your foundation. So what, are you, what have yeah. you been some of your practices? Because I know you've worked with, uh, you told me a story about a really, really amazing master and, and how you met him and how he came to be. But what are, what are some of your practices that have helped you to find yeah. that deeper but, sense of self? Yeah, I would say I've met two masters in my life. One was, they call them ascended masters, right? In the form of light. He told me what the goal was. I'm come not to judge, but to love. You know, you can, I, I don't know how to make the goal clear for human beings. Mm -hmm. That as a universal goal. I'm not talking about just me personally. Sure. I'm talking about why? Because only love works and judgment divides. That's right. So I am come not to ju judge, but to love. And then I started thinking about it and, you know, getting like the senses of it and how it applies and everything. But then it started to become more and more of a memory. And so then occurred to me, geez, there must be a way that I can live in that presence on a moment to moment basis. And that led me to a 14 year old boy. I was 30. And he said, he said, uh, I don't remember. I mean, I was so space, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I was, I was very in my head <laughs> for a long time. And I, I, he talked for two hours, two days, one hour each. 
I remember only one sentence. He said, the peace you search for in the world is within you and I can reveal you that peace. And I can uh, reveal you that peace? That's what he said? I can reveal you that peace. Mm -hmm. And, or, you know, he also said, uh, give me your love and I will give you peace. So, but, but that one sentence, the peace you search for in the world is within you and I can reveal you that peace. That really grabbed me. And I was thinking, well, he's 14, I'm 30. What's a 14 year old <laughs> teach me? I've been around. So I was really skeptical. But then I kind of logic down and said, well, you know, I, 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 peace is important to me because, you know, I came out of the war, so peace is important. So I'll check it out. And if he can do it, if he can't do it, I'll just keep looking. And if he can, I wouldn't want to miss it. So then I showed me the, the, the method. And I thought the method was too simple. Because my <laughs> thinking was, we made it to the moon. It was really complicated to get there. We haven't made it to peace. So peace must be more complicated complicated than going to the moon. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, that's why, and, and the logic was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> the assumption was wrong. <laughs> well, right. it, it, was, it was logical, which has no access to heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah and, and I didn't know, right? And so then I said, well, he said, give, give it a fair chance. He called it knowledge, self-knowledge. Give it a fair chance. And I said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll try it for six months. Well, it turned out that the woman I was living with you know, every day I would get up, she'd be in the kitchen, I'd get up later than her. We were living in the mountains in Colorado in a cabin way up on 9,100 9, feet. And uh, I'd, I'd, I'd come walk into the living room and I'd say one thing and she would immediately take the opposite view and we'd get into an argument. <laughs> and the argument would get so intense because, you know, I always wanted her to agree with me. <laughs> and uh, she apparently always had her, her own motor inside of her. <laughs> And so it would get so intense that I was like in a place where I was either going to belt her or I needed to leave. So I would leave the cabin and sit down on a, on a log and do the practice. And he recommended an hour and I couldn't sit still for that long ever, five to 10 minutes, maybe. So I'd sit there with this fried head right on a log and do the, do the practice. And by the time I've done five or 10 minutes of the practice, I would look at this and say, fuck, we argued about that. How trivial. Hmm. And, then I re and then I learned that if I did the practice before I went in the kitchen, I wouldn't rise to the bait in the wow. argument. Amazing. And so by the time six months were up, I said, fuck, this works. So I've been doing it now for <laughs> 47 years. <laughs> he was 14 then. He's 62 now. It's a same, same message. He, goes around the world every, every year a bunch of times. He's a corporate pilot. So he has a, a, a plane that's been leased for him. He's never charged for, for his work. Incredible. So he, he gets volunteer donations. And, you know, if you, if you want to check him out, you know, he's, he doesn't talk like me. I'm, you know, and he doesn't, you know, you don't, you don't learn a way to speak about things. You get to be yourself. You get to talk your own experience, your own language. And, but he te teaches a way to get in touch with yourself. And, uh, <clears throat> and if you want to check it out, Timeless Today is, uh, is his website. And there's something can, can called- Can you just share that one story with him when, when he was like eight? And I think you said his father had died or something. And he's yeah, he, he was, yeah. And you know, you always say, well, how can a guy so young know all this stuff? How can, be, how can he be a master? He started when he was eight. And, and he came, you know, unlike me, who was born in a war, he was born in the family of a master. And so the topic in that family was this topic. Yeah. So he fundamentally gave me his childhood. Right. So, you know, you know how they say it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Yeah. Right. He basically gave me access to the childhood he had. And of course, when you have that, when you've be, been given that gift, that that kind of a, a good fortune right what's the best thing to do with it share it with as many people as you can yeah. so his message went out to a billion people last year and wow. he's very laid back he says i'm nobody's rock star he just does what he does the, the opposite of mr tony well yeah i got I, I had some really good good experiences with mr tony and but inter interestingly enough the uh, last time I saw him, we're actually friends, right? 
and he's been a huge supporter of my oil. Uh, and um, uh, what I was going to say is so being a really great supporter. I've had really good experiences in the in the setting he sets up, in which people can also find their own uniqueness to some extent. There are lots of followers, but everybody has followers that that just babble babble the the lore and don't and don't and don't use it for their own self discovery. Yeah, right. Sure. So. Um, so yeah, I uh, and oh yeah, and so I know I was going to say. So uh, uh, interestingly enough, the thing that Tony has the hardest time with is sitting still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, because he, he, he's a doer. He's a doer, right? Doer. Amazing, amazing what he does. One of the best I'll doers you, on planet Earth. Yeah, and I'll tell you what. What I think is the the, the difference. Everything that we teach. Make, can make a terrorist a better terrorist and a saint a better saint, except this one journey inward. Because when you start living not from the heart and doing heartless things, you automatically disconnect yourself from the magnificence of the experience of your own life. Yeah. So, it, the, so it's instant karma, right? So the instant karma is built into that and then you can get back, but only when you, when you learn what you've needed to learn and get to the point where you say, okay, that was not a good thing to do. I, I, I think maybe I'm not going to do that again. Mm. And I have those experiences like that. I've had done my share of heartless things too. Sure. Right. But that's the, that's the, and how cool is it to get, to have one thing that is beyond being misused? Because if you misuse it, you lose it. Hmm. You lose your connection to it. That's so cool, right? <clears throat> now, uh, I used to do my practice for myself because uh, I knew I needed it. For me, it was important given my background. And uh, so, so I enjoyed doing the practice and, and uh, took, it, took it pretty seriously. Gave it priority doing this. I gave that priority in my life. So sure. it means if I have something to do at eight in the morning, I'll get up at six so I can do my practice. Sure. And how, just out of curiosity, how long is your practice t today uh, on a regular basis? Well, uh, he, he, recommended, uh, uh, he recommended a week, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, a week, a, a week a day. <laughs> a week a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, he recommended an hour. Uh, I, was, uh, I had a job at one point where I couldn't do an hour and I would flog myself for not doing the whole hour as I had promised. Mm. You know what? Then I realized, you know what? I did 15 minutes. Why don't I give myself credit for what I did do, That's not right. beat myself up for what I didn't do. Amen. I, and now I, I do an hour. Sometimes I'll do two. I just, you know, the older I get, the more I, I love that place. And it's so creative. And I write out of that place. And a lot of like the, the writing that I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of writing now, uh, literally comes out of that space because I don't want to just write bullshit. I want to write something connected to to the, the, the beauty of, of existence, right? So describe, describe the space for people because I, I, I think Elon and I have a, a fair bit of playtime there. What do you mean uh, describe the space? Well, you said the space, like, so somebody here is, well, that's where I do a fair bit of writing from that space, oh, right? So oh, I that, think intuition yeah. would be the easy, <laughs> well, easy the space is an, The space is an experience. I met a woman once who was in a coma for, close to four years after car accident when she was 21 and she wrote music from her coma hmm. so i so i asked her you know i i find i find stories like that really interesting i said do you remember where you were when you were in the coma right because your obviously awareness was not out in the world yeah but it was somewhere and you were alive so it, so some you you must have been somewhere she said yeah i remember where i was I was floating in infinite space just in front of my backbone. Wow. <laughs> and, and, I, <clears throat> and I would say that's a pretty good description of the space. Wow. You know, that's not my description. That was her description. Yeah, sure. But, <clears throat> but because I was doing the practice, I could relate to it. And so she found it easy to talk to me because most people mm -hmm. couldn't, couldn't ask the question and didn't really know how to address it. And to me, I just have a, a lot of curiosity. So what is it like if you, <clears throat> if I, if I close my eyes and then 
I just get really still and then see how deep I can go into that stillness. I end up in a place, first of all, there's complete peace. Some people call it boring because <laughs> there's nothing going on. But so then I say, well, fall in love with boredom because notice how peaceful it is. Notice how unstressed it is. Notice how all of you, notice how rich it feels. Notice how light it feels. Notice that you can see light in that darkness. Because, you know, when you close your eyes, it's supposed to be dark inside. But if you go deep enough into the darkness, there's light in it. Just the same thing. If you get silent, you will hear a sound in the silence. And not, not the one that the, the, the uh, <clears throat> not like the song. That's a different sound of silence. Okay. But th there is a sound in silence. There is, a, there is a feeling in emptiness. And all you have to do is get closer and closer and closer to yourself. And you discover, oh, hey, I have everything. I have more than everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, and then the other thing is that when, when you go into that space, that space has no limits. So when she says infinite space in front of my backbone, yeah, I, I don't even see the backbone. But, but, but the, so you go into the peace that is the core of your being. And you're a center of a peace that from there goes out to infinity. There's no limit to it. It is not limited by your body. Your access point is the core of you, the inner core of your being, right? And so you find out from that, oh my God, peace. You know, that people have been praying and hoping and wishing for, not doing anything for, but, right. <clears throat> but hoping for, especially when the shit hits the fan. Right? That peace has always been everywhere. There is no place where peace is not right now. But only peace knows that. So if you can't see peace everywhere, it means peace, you as peace, is not doing the looking. Yeah, there's, there's, but uh, you're, gaps. You're, looking, you're looking with your mind and you're looking with your physicals and, you know, but the peace is everywhere. Even on the battlefield when people are killing each other. There is peace inside those people, between those people, above those people, below those people, around those people, everywhere. Hmm. But what are they focused on? You're my enemy, I'm going to kill you. And the other guy, you're my any, uh, enemy, I'm going to kill you. And they're do, killing each other in perfect peace. Right? Now, if they knew that, they'd probably sit down and say, what the fuck are we doing this for? <laughs> and, and say, uh, you know, and they'd share lunch. Right? And, so, and some do. And some do. Yeah. Uh, so as someone- Oh, does that answer your question, Guy? Yeah, I, for sure. I if feel like that, that space. Yeah, like you, it's difficult to give awareness language from the mind. Of course. What, <laughs> yeah, I, of course. what I love about awareness, and I, that's why I'm just curious, you know, like how, how we do articulate it, because you seem to be yeah. um, very beautiful in how you articulate things. So I, you know, I think the awareness is probably the journey of the 21st century, awareness and energy. Yeah. Because yeah, focus. Uh, awareness, uh, yeah, because yeah. because your reality comes from where you focus your awareness. Absolutely. If you focus it on peace, that becomes your reality. If you focus it on war, that becomes your reality. If you focus it on fear, you know, then you see danger everywhere. If you focus it on anger, then you see enemies everywhere. And if you're if you're a pickpocket, you know, all you see all you see is people's pockets. <laughs> yeah. Right. What I what I love about awareness is that it doesn't require a uh, a manual. You know, right. you, you point you point to people about the things that they've been doing intuitively their whole lives, but nobody's ever taken the time to just point and say, "Hey, did, you know, you notice that that's that's you yeah, right yeah. there. You know, right. that's you with your awareness right there." And and that inquiry of of awareness in general, the pervasive nature of it, the always awake nature of it, the peaceful nature, like the all encompassing nature, it's really like, uh, you know, for where our work has gone too, has created so much curiosity inquiry in my life. It really is. Mm -hmm. It's self-healing, it's self-regulating, it's self-organizing. There's nothing that any of us need to ever do. Like you said, anything that everybody prays for and wishes for is an existence within them and without them everywhere all the time. It's just, what are you orienting yourself to? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, actually, I, I, I have eight parts that where the focus goes. So the first one is internal awareness. So that means becoming aware of being aware. Yes. And then everything else that happens is outside, is, you know, comes out of that or happens within that awareness. 
So then the second is life energy. And you can see it, you can hear it, you can taste it, you can feel it inside, just like your senses, because your senses are your, are your receptors for energy, for energy and for change, right? But inside, there's energy too. And you can see it, hear it, feel it, and taste it as well. So that's number two. Number three is inspiration. That's sort of the extension of, uh, of the, the light, the, the light that you are. And those three are beyond health and illness. And I don't know about inspiration, but uh, energy is beyond death too. Hmm. Something in you, you're, you're, and, and if you are life, then you are actually never sick. You know, so you can say, well, I'm not sick, but my body is. Hmm. Right? Hmm. And, and, and uh, it, it can't get sick and it never dies. Something in you is eternal right now. Right? And you think you got to wait till you die to get there. But, my, but <laughs> according to some people, uh, if you don't find it now, you ain't going to find it after either. Right? So, they, so, so that, puts the, that, that, that puts the boot on you again to, <laughs> to, do, to do your homework here <laughs> and not hope that somebody else will do the homework for you. Agreed. Right? And the government isn't going to do it for you and, and your religion isn't going to do it for you either. Right. You know, but you can live within a government or and a religion. Sure. But still be present in your own space and do your own homework. Sure. And it's actually really important that, that we as individuals do that homework independent of what our circumstances are. And then, we, and then we bring something into our circumstances that is better than what comes at us from our circumstances. We really so, are all walking an individualized journey. Yeah. Uh, spirit and yeah. everyone's walking in parallel yeah. to one another but yeah. no one can no one can walk this journey for you yeah. no one can inquire for you even if life is extraordinarily difficult i agree in yeah. your choices to commit suicide you have not relieved yourself of any pain at all because yeah. whatever is coming next is going to be just as difficult and yeah concern you just just the same way you're not giving yeah. yourself any breaks at all yeah so now the third the fourth place for for the focus for focus is physical body and then we're, now we're talking food, fitness, and all the stuff that usually people talk about when they talk about health, and when they ignore all the rest that is even more important to health than, than fit, food and fitness. Uh, and, then, um, and then there's survival smarts, which is how do you stay uh, calm under fire dealing with emergencies mm. and crises that come up, survival fit, fitness. Then there's a social group, you know, uh, how you you know, who you hang out with affects your health. Community. And then there's uh, uh, nature, planet, solar system, environment. That affects your health. And then there's a big picture, how you feel about being a, uh, you know, being in a temporary body in an infinite universe. That's the big picture, right? And being, and being okay with that and feeling okay about it and being present to it. You know, and if you can be present to in all of your being and your surroundings, then you're then you're living then you're living the best possible life that you can, and you won't be lost in thoughts in your head because <laughs> where we lose where we lose everything is getting lost in thoughts in our head. I'd love to ask from a uh, someone who's been at this practice for decades. Mm. You know. Uh, I look at Guy and I, and I definitely see us on the path and I look at someone like you and it's, I just see you kind of like further down that same path, right? Like, like having had just more of that experience. And then there's people who are listening right now that might just be starting their, yeah. their path down a journey. Right. Yeah. And they might listen to some of these concepts and be like, I don't know what the fuck these people are talking about. Awareness, aware of awareness. And oh, but I bet they like the boundless. feeling. They like the feeling. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, but that's the thing. I think that there's yeah. something resonating inside, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and I'm happy to share mine. I just really want to hear yours. Yeah. The, the guy said this great line the other day where he's like, there's certain things that you're going to learn. They're going to make immediate impact. You know, like you, you learn them, it hits and you can carry them in your life. These things that we're all pointing to and talking about here today, these are things yeah. that take life like 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 your entire life to keep mastering and, and we'll just kind of be on a slow burn so 
for someone that has been doing it for a long time, you know, I don't know if you can even remember, but when you started the journey, the level of awareness where you are today and the access that you have to drop into these states, do you remember what it was like when you first started when mm -hmm. mind was still so involved yeah. and there was all yep. this efforting and trying and all that stuff? I'd yep. love for you just to kind of give us like a little bit of your roadmap, the best way that you can describe it, however it comes out, just so people get a sense yeah. of like, this is real and possible and it just takes time. Yeah. Well, first of all, we're, we're all works in progress. That's not going to end until I go horizontal permanently. And, I, and you know what? I'm totally okay with it. And it gets better and better. This is not something that you get tired of. Actually, with practice, it gets better and better, like they say about old wines, right? It gets better and better with practice. Uh, I think all my changes, because when people want to make changes, because they're living out of line with the, their own mag magnificence, Correct. I think most of my changes come, come through insights. And the insights come from going to a deeper state of being because all the insights are already there. Everything Einstein knew is in every human being. You know, and, and life is mo way more genius than Einstein. Yes. You know, even the life in someone who has trisomy 21, uh, what's it called, Down syndrome. Right? And Down syndrome, sometimes some Down syndrome, not all of them, but some of them have some mental limits. Sure, but sure. life in a kid with Down syndrome is more genius than Einstein. Mm. And all Einstein did, he just tapped into some of that. Because yes. he says, you know, 99 times I think and think and think and I get nothing. And then I, and then I relax, float in silence and the answer comes to me. Yes. He's not making up the answers. He's like, he's just going to the place where the answers already are. Yeah. It's like fishing. I, yeah. He, he, well, he's even, yeah, he's not even fishing. <laughs> he's waiting to, for the fish to jump in the boat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> even, fishing, even fishing is doing too much. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. And, and uh, so uh, when I started, it was tough, you know, because it was, first of all, I thought it was really strange. I already told you that. I thought it was really strange. It was like I wasn't used to it. And it was, why would a guy, you know, why would a guy sit down and do this weird thing, right? It just seemed weird. Just simply seemed weird because I hadn't done it. Yeah. Just like everything new is weird, right? And then I would sit in the practice and I'd struggle with it. And I, and I would say to myself, this is so hard. Wow, this is so hard. And one day, it was an insight. It occurred to me. Gee, I wonder what would happen if I say, this is really easy. So I, you know, and this is like faking it, right? Yeah. So I said, oh, wow, this is so easy. And you know what? My practice became easy that day. Wow. That change. Because I didn't realize, but I now get that what I was saying was putting the block. If, they, if I had no thought at all, I'd already be in that place. Right? So I was actually creating the obstacle in my own mind by what I was saying to myself. And, uh, you know, it's the same, it's kind of the same as you were talking about how we, we chose to be born in certain situations. You know, I used to argue with that, you know, somebody told me once in way back in the hippie days, you know, somebody told me, well, you chose to be born in a war. And I just gave him the finger, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> I said, no, I was, I didn't choose to be born in a war. The reason I'm here is because my parents had sex. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then uh, a few, uh, a long time later, I said, you know, I heard, I heard it again. I mean, it's sort of been, I've, I've heard it a, a few times. And then I decided one time, gee, well, I don't believe it, but I wonder what it would feel like if I did. And so I tried it out and I found out that, uh, my war, instead of being cursed, became a gift because of what it led me to, because it rubbed my nose in, in the importance of cultivating peace yep. before the war hits yep. and thereby preventing the war. It, it, it made me realize that the fact that my father and I never got, got along made me very independent and very... Uh, responsible for my own thinking and the fact that my mother left me behind was a gift because I need to be able to stand on my own feet hmm. and so all of these tragedies that that I would bitch about and I did that I, I mean the war ended when I before I was three I was still bitching about it when I was 27 
And at one point it occurred to me, uh, a couple of things occurred to me. One was, and it was like literally the first time it occurred to me <clears throat> that way. The whole time that I've been bitching about the war, during the war and after the war, something has taken perfect care of me inside and I've given that no attention at all. Wow. And I've not given it no gratitude at all. Shit, maybe I should get to know that a little better. Mm. That was a turnaround. That was one oh, turnaround. That's big. And, and so literally everything that's happened in our lives, on the one hand, becomes educational once you can separate the emotion from it. And once you can uh, t separate your victimization from it. And once you can bring your awareness back to the place in you that was not affected by your dramas or, and your traumas. And then you go back to living your life from the place of life instead of in reaction to the trauma. Now you have to deal with the traumas and there's ways to talk it through and have your cries and you know, do the, the things you need to do. But at some point you got to get back to living life. And, and so there are always two things to do in trauma. One is to address the, the, the trauma and, and talk and walk your way through that. And the second is suck back behind it to the deeper place from which life is, is still perfect and has always been perfect. And when people, when I talked like that to people who've been through trauma, they see a lot of hope in that because they hardly ever get told that there's something in them that was not affected yeah. and that that may be worth finding. Right? Because if you can't let it go, then you're just going to perpetuate. Right? The more we talk about rape, the more rape there will be. The more we talk about war, the more war there will be. The more we, you know, the more we talk about peace, the more peace there will be. The more, the more we practice peace, the more peace we're going to experience. The more we practice anger, the more anger we're going to experience. We get good at what we practice. Let me, let me ask you a quick question about that. Because I, 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 I'm in agreement with you. But we see, you know, people protesting in the streets and they yeah. will think, well, I'm protesting for peace. Yeah. So, but there's a difference between um, aligning to peace or what protests are is like a complaining about a lack, like a protest to me is like complaining about a lack of something. So yeah. it's like, it's like a different part is involved with that. I would, let's call it the mind is more involved with that, you know, cause I find it's like, Hey, I could do a gratitude practice. Okay. But if yeah. while, I, while I'm doing a gratitude practice, the entire time, all I'm thinking about is how I don't have what I want in my life and yeah. um, scarcity and stuff like that. The gratitude practice is not doing very much because what I'm aligning myself is to scarcity. <clears throat> yeah. So would you say that there is a differentiation between understanding or at least starting to get glimpse, glimpse awareness in such a way that you understand your own alignment, inner truth, so that when you are projecting and creating in the world, that there is an eminence and a frequency and a vibration that I don't want to say is pure, but you, you kind of get what I'm getting at over here. Do yeah, you yeah. think there's a difference yeah, yeah. how we? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I, I was in the peace movement when, uh, uh, and they called it a peace movement, but what it was really was, was an anti-war movement. Yes. And so they were focused on war. And when you're focused on war, you're not building peace. And I didn't know that when I started, but then I found out there were also people who had different agendas that were trying to find power positions uh, <clears throat> by becoming the, the, the people who, who managed the people who were dissatisfied and were focused on war, right? And when I found that out, I left because I was actually looking for peace. Yeah. And if you're looking for peace, then you're going to find peace in peace. And, and, and also, when you're protesting, you're always protesting against something. And, and you're already saying when you're protesting that you're not taking responsibility for the thing that you want. You want somebody else to bring it for you. Right? So, and, you know, when, when you graduate from your mother, then your government becomes your mother. And everything that's wrong in your life, you blame on the government and you want the government to bring it. But then you already know that you, you, what the better standard would be but you, you don't want to take responsibility for building it because building it is hard work. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so I, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, there is a time for voicing uh, your opinion in a, in a, in a world of opinions. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, 
Greta Thunberg races around and rubs people's noses in their hypocrisy. Uh, I, I like that energy, but uh, that energy will not bring, that will not bring uh, the changes to the environment sure. it's that need to happen. It's like, it's now, like using shame and guilt to try to cure a problem. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and, and that it gets more attention for people who haven't paid attention to it, I think that, it, that can be helpful, but it's not the solution. Sure. Finding sure. trees might be a solution. So, you know, instead of going to listen to her, maybe I could just plant 10 trees in that time, if that's, if that's the solution. Or maybe I could walk to the market instead of driving my car. Or, or uh, maybe I could uh, work on the insulation in my house so that I don't blow, blow so much, so much um, energy through it. That's, that's, you know, coming from coal or something. Right, so there are little things we can, or I can take my cup to go and get my my Starbucks, mm. and not and not waste a paper paper cup every time, and those are all little things. But if eight bi billion people do all those little things, uh, quite a bit changes. Yeah, right. And I do I do because I I spend a lot of time in education. I do like to listen to what people have to say, on, even if they even if they don't work but then I can articulate that, right? So I'm in a, in a unique situation. I watch CNN all the time and I watch Fox sometimes wow, and I yeah. listen to all the stuff they bitch about and I find it inspiring. Wow. But I only find it inspiring because it's subservient to a mission of making the world work for everybody. And then, and, and then finding out how things work and having art, you know, because then I can tell you what, what's wrong with, you know, why, why things in America aren't working between the political parties. Very simple. And I know what their positions are, but you know what the, what the problem is? Neither one side nor the other does the practice of connecting to their humanity. Sure. And then, and then they see each other as, as ideas, and then they'll fight each other as ideas, and then they'll kill the, each other and send people to kill, be killed for those ideas. Yeah, it's the same, same issue with Israel. Palestine. Oh, no, so I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not picking on the U.S. It's the yeah, same. yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm. I'm, 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 retorting, I'm retorting that it's a global yeah. issue of how yeah, people are doing things. Yeah, of course. And politics yeah. everywhere is dirty and corrupt, and you know, because if you're discontent, getting more for you. You know, if you're discontent, you're going to always be a getter. Everything you do is going to be. How's that going to take care of me? And you always get yourself more than you give the other person. That's that's the nature of it. When you're content, you become a giver, because if you're taking, if you feel taken care of, and it's and it's really taken care of is a feeling, not a situation. When you feel taken care of, then you can do what needs to be done. Then you can help where you can. Then it's not always about who's going to pay me for this, right? Because there's a lot of things you, that need to be done that nobody's going to pay you. And if you want to build it better, then you always got to give more than you get. But if you, but if you start from doing your homework and you, and you know you already have everything and you don't need to get more, then literally you can build and build and build and build. Sure. You know? And and your 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 real needs are pretty small. Need a little food. Need a little need a little water. Need a, need some air. You know. Need to use the shitter sometimes. You know. <laughs> need to sleep. You know. This like there's not a lot that we need. And the richness of life doesn't come from our needs. It comes from, from our, our, it comes from our nature. It's built into our nature. We came loaded with all the goodies we're looking for in the world. Yeah. Well, this makes me very optimistic for the time that we're in because this, this generation, the young generation, the millennial generation, you know, they get slack for entitlement and stuff like this, but, to be honest, I remember people them saying that about my generation too, and we don't do anything, and we're lazy, and we're this. It's like you know, every generation is always going to look back and say we were greater. What the hell are you guys doing? Yeah, but the but reality, entitlement, you know, entitlement is just a way of trying to get your get your get your needs met when you don't know that you already have them met. <laughs> sure, <Right? laughs> sure. But at the same time, I mean, I mean, and entitlement is a skill. It's like you're trying to extract it from others, and you, it's a way of doing it. It's just a skill. Yeah, it doesn't get it done because you because when you're entitled, you always feel entitled because you never get what you want.
but that's because you already have what you want and you're looking away from it instead of looking into it. I think that's like the media marketed version of what's going on today. When I meet young people today, I'm extremely uh, taken back because yeah, like right. this is the first generation that's grown up with information yeah. experiences available to them in a worldview yeah. that's immediately available from the moment that you're very, very young. We didn't have that. And yeah. their level of uh, knowledge, also that they're immediately creating something in the world. They're interested in art. They're yeah. interested in uh, supporting uh, their, their, their self-interest, the interests of others. Like It really is a shift in consciousness and energy in a way that makes me extraordinarily optimistic. But yeah. I also see a level of spirituality today yeah. in people outside of what traditional religion has brought forth, where their level of interest in exploration of what's really possible is really on, on a new frontier. So while so much of what people think is like, there's negativity going on in the world, I'm like, I've never been more optimistic about the direction of the world yeah. right, than right now. It's yeah. fascinating to watch. Yeah, I, yeah. and, and I, you know what saves us is the, uh, the greatest gift that we've been given other than being alive. Love. Thirst of the heart. Hmm. Right? Because the heart will be thirsty and you will do all the things you're going to do that won't, doesn't work until you get to the point where you finally address the thirst of the heart. Or somebody explained to you that that's your heart calling your awareness to come back home mm. to life. And that will be there and it will nag you until you do. <laughs> the thirst of, I'll tell you what though, the thirst of the mind yeah. is so much louder than the thirst of the heart that it takes people quite some time of running around trying to quench the thirst of the mind, realizing that it's unquenchable and never satisfied. And it's like, Oh, you got me the million dollar house. Okay. Now go get me the $2 million house. Oh, you got me the Rolls Royce. Now go get me the Bentley. You got this raise. Now go get me that. And it's like the heart and is. And that's why you guys need to be talking about it. <laughs> because when people hear that it doesn't work, you know, because work. everybody like the model in the world from, from discontent people is, get more, get more, get more, do this, do more, do, you know, all of that, right? Yeah. So where, so where is the voice that says, hey, it's not in your noise that you contentment. It's not in your noise that you feel taken care of. It's mm -hmm. in your silence that you get taken care of. It's not, in your, it's not in your doing that your heart will be fulfilled, but your heart will be fulfilled by you sitting with your unfulfilled heart and feeling it and then slipping behind it because just like that far behind it, is what you're looking for. And when you feel fulfilled, your life completely changes. Yeah. Because now you can, because now you feel taken care of, now you're free to do what needs to be done. Until you feel taken care of, you're always only gonna do what will get, get you taken care of, what you hope will get you taken care of. I hit that point when I was 17. I couldn't shake my heartache anymore. Wow, that's really young. And I couldn't find any distractions. Well, again, that started, you know, I. I, I, I got the crash course, <laughs> <laughs> crash course started with, well, let's see, let's, let's teach this kid. Uh, okay. Let's start with a war. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, and, and, uh, and then it was 13 years before I knew, before I learned a method to, to bring it home, but it nagged me and it's nagging them. And so I have conversations about the thirst of the heart mm. to reframe it, to make it, to make people understand, to get people to understand that it is a huge gift because it's like hunger. If you never got hungry when you needed to eat, you wouldn't eat and you'd, you'd die. Totally. It's like if you didn't, didn't know when to drink and so you never drank. Our thirst of the heart is just a, an, a hunger, just like those, only for connection to your own source. To your own yeah. self, to your own God, to your own. Oh, it just, it's just life. so blocked by so much junk. Yeah, but you know what? This is not different than it ever was. Because there's only one way to go home. One way meaning uh, you have to go to the place where the home is. Yeah. I don't mean methods, but you got to go. There's only one, one place to go to get home. And there's only one place you need to be distracted by to forget about that. Hmm. Now we have more distractions, but you only need one. You've always only needed one. So you, have a, you can have a monk sitting in a monastery and 
a woman walks by and there goes there, there go his vows, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he's already isolated himself so that he has, doesn't have a lot of distractions. But you only need one. Or you only need have, to have one thought. Yeah. And you're already yeah. distracted. So we are not more distracted now than we were then. We do have much, many more distractions we can choose from, but you only need one. Yeah. Because right? you're either home or you're distracted. <laughs> you're so home true. or you're distracted. You're home or you're distracted. You're home in whatever direction. You know, you're surrounded by distractions. If, you, if you're not cultivating a way to stay home in yourself and then walking through the world at the same time that you're home in yourself. That's called simultaneous presence. Yeah. Right? Because you bring your state of being into everything you do. You can't buy that. So if your state of being is fully present in all of your being and you're just like ecstatic about, about the temporary gift that you are, you're ecstatic about that, then you start you bring that into the world. Everybody's yeah. here. And and there's something really beautiful about that that I think uh, maybe most people don't consider. It's like you know, you're in a um, difficult relationship, let's say. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people... All, all relationships are difficult. Yeah, you know, but like, like someone top of mind is like, oh, you know, my partner does this or my partner does that, etc. And, and they look for solutions to try, in essence, I mean, they might like verbalize it differently, but in essence, they're looking to fix their partner. Like if their partner's yeah, yeah. doing this thing... You're trying to manipulate them. them. Yeah, exactly. Fundamentally. And... Into your into to look like your fantasy about them exactly to to make yeah. the inside so you're not feel even talking to a real person yeah to make the inside feel comfortable and what yeah. I've started to play with the more and more I do this and especially with my kids because mm. I find that kids are just very attuned to energy without all the logic stuff yeah. you know like if my daughter um, has a tantrum because something happened right like something didn't go her way etc yeah. typical typical like even good parent behavior is yeah. to try to help this child, right? Like, it's not that big a deal and let's look at this and let's try to figure it out, et cetera. And none of that stuff works. It yeah. just actually activates them more and more and more. And what I've started to play with is, okay, instead of going in and logicking this thing, yeah, go in with attunement and sit in presence awareness and say nothing. Just hold space for this little yeah. being yeah. to have their experience. Yeah. And I have to tell you that time and time again, I am in awe of how well both it the result and the speed in which the result comes about yeah. for me not adding anything other than my presence awareness. Right. But, the, and so but, but, when, we, but, when we do this thing, like you can single-handedly mm-hmm. shift the world into peace Jesus yep. walked around and people said like he would walk into a city and all these people got healed. Yep. I, I fully believe that understanding that you can walk in a certain alignment and frequency that yep. creates a field of healing around you. Yeah. Yeah. But in order to do that, you have to first do your homework. Oh, lots of it. How, how old are your kids? So my daughter's about to turn seven and my son's uh, eight and a half. Oh, cool. Yeah. They're, they're beautiful little energetic beings. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, and oh, they're, it's lucky. They're, ha- they're lucky to have a dad who, do- who does his homework. I um, might, you know what? I, I told my kids, you know, you're not ready for a relationship until you have, until you have committed to your relationship to your own life. Because if you're not committed to your own life, why would anybody, uh, why would you be able to be trusted to commit to anybody else's life? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because you're still on the you're still on the getting, yeah. If you're not if, if you're not giving, you're getting. You know, if you're if you're not in a place where you feel taken care of and are free to give, then you're fundamentally just using the situation and using everybody in that situation. Yeah, you're also calling and that, that guarantees uh, trouble. That guarantees. Yeah. Well, you well you're calling into point. your life a person. So if you're not well inside. Yeah. then you're going to keep calling into your life. And you make everybody to, else sick. <laughs> yeah, to people to reflect back to you yeah. the parts that aren't well or that need you looking at. But most yeah. people don't have that level of awareness, so they keep attracting the same being over and over and over, yeah. blaming everyone in the world for why they can't make it hap- 
happen in relationships. Meanwhile, yeah. like all there is, is, Hey, just stop looking out there, look in here and like start doing that work. And yeah. different men and different women are going to show up in your life. That's, that's for sure. Yep. Um, amazing. I mean, I could do this all day. Um, I, I value your time. Um, I would love to have you on again. I mean, this is just like, let's do it. I know, I know guys and I's favorite types of conversations. So yeah. Um, I would love for you to share whatever you want people to connect to you. I know you have a, a book, Totally Sexy Health, but like anything that you want to share, websites, okay. you know, wherever you want people uh, to find you. Yeah, so the, for the products, udoschoice.com, that's where the products are. And the, the book on fats is called Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill. Uh, the, the other stuff, the stuff we're t mostly talking about, I have a, an overview book on it. It's called uh, The Book on Total Sexy Health, The Eight Key Parts Designed by Nature. Not a big book, uh, but a lot of stuff in it. Yeah. And uh, if you go to theudo.com, uh, that's the website where we're doing, we're doing some courses and we're doing lots of different topics. What's really cool about it, under the umbrella of, of he uh, health, and basing it on nature and human nature, I, I can address every problem on the planet. I have insights when I do my practice and get to the quiet place. I have insights into politics and I have insights into medicine. I have insights into, into like you name the topic. There's, there is something useful in you, in that place that you can apply to any situation in your life. Hmm. And it's kind of, it's like, it's nice. I've always wanted to address every problem on the planet. I can do it under the umbrella of health, but I could do it under other umbrellas too. And so we're, we're doing some courses. Uh, the foundation of it is the essence of human being, nature, human nature. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Udo, it was, uh, it, it's, yeah. a, it's so beautiful to just. I, lo I love what you, I love what you guys are doing. And you're, doing, you. and, and you're pretty young for doing it. Thank you, brother. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's very cool. Listening to you is like listening to an artist. Yeah, right? Describe spirituality and consciousness and awareness. It's a pleasure to listen to you. Yeah, yeah you. I, I just want to give you a, a quick compliment. You know, Guy and I started doing, um, we started with Landmark way back in the day, 2003. Yeah, I know, I know. I've, I heard a couple of times, I heard a couple of words that come from there. I've done some land, Landmark courses. Yeah. Um, and I remember there were people when we started out, people in that work that when we spoke, like I knew they had been in the work for a long time, right? Like I'm talking people who had done this for 10, 15, 20 years. And I remember looking at Guy. Guy was 19 at the time. I was 21. I said, do you realize when we're going to be 30, we're going to talk like these people. Like we're going to, you know, they just had this clarity and this poetic way that they could describe life. <clears throat> By the way, when I turned 30 and guy was 28 is when we uh, created Sorry. Satori Prime. So it's, it's just like, it was really funny. I listened to you because I know now the work that we do is very different than that kind of work that we do. It's, it's much more in this awareness and, you know, all the things that we've been talking about here today. I listen to you and I also have this vision. I'm like, Ooh, one day we're going to get to talk about it like that also. Sure. Sure. Um, and it just, I don't know. It makes my heart like really warm and fuzzy and, and yeah, I just want to thank you. It's, it's such an honor to be around someone that's dedicated their life's practice to just going in and in and in and finding that infinite vastness. Um, yeah. It's amazing. And I only do it because it's, it's more beautiful than anything else. There is. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Well, guys, we'll have all the uh, links in the show notes where you guys can get in touch with uh, Udo and uh, yeah, on behalf of myself, Guy, all the guests. Thank you. Thank you for being thank you. here. Thank you for sharing your gift. Thank Keep you. Doing the good work. We'll yeah. see you guys soon. You too.